standing, everybody. Let's open up our hymnals to number 413. Love lifted me. Number 413. Let's get started. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. All my heart to him I give, ever to him I'll cling. In his blessed presence live, ever his praises sing. Love so mighty and so true merits my soul's best songs. Faithful, loving service to to him belong. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Souls in danger, look above. Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea, billows his will obey. He, your Savior, wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Amen. Amen. It's good to see you tonight. Is it already 7 o'clock? Man, today has been busy. We have buckled down and knuckled down and been running all day. So I saw it rain on the cameras. I didn't get to go outside and see it, but it was on the cameras. Good stuff. Brother Spracklin, would you open us in prayer? Father, we thank you for the rain we got today. Thank you for traveling mercy getting here. Thank you for the joy of being open. Please be with preach. Bring him the message. Let our hearts, minds, and ears be open. Let Amen. us apply that message. Please be with those who can't be with us now. Or ask this in your son's name. Amen. 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 All right, you can be seated. It's uh, good to see you tonight, midweek service, and uh, we have been running. It's been it's been a good time though. We had a good uh, men's meeting on uh, Monday night and had a pretty good turnout. Had uh, eighteen there, and so that was good. And uh, ladies, your meeting is this coming Monday, so don't forget about that. And uh, what are y'all doing? Are y'all doing food this time? What are you doing? Hot luck. All right. You're going to bring, bring your favorites. So uh, but that, that'll be good. So we have a lot going on. Uh, keep uh, Brother Noah and I in, in prayer. We'll be catching a plane in the morning and flying down to Guatemala real quick. And uh, to go see uh, Jessica and Joseph's family down there. And uh, it's their 15th anniversary of that church, starting that church. And so um, we're going to be going down there. I'll be preaching Saturday and Sunday there both. So... Be in your place here. Some preachers don't tell anybody when they're leaving because nobody will show up. Please be in, at your place, okay? <laughs> hey, if, I, if I'm out of town, if I'm preaching somewhere, or, or if I'm gone to heaven, be here. Be in your place. <laughs> it's an encouragement to other people, and it actually implies like you might actually believe what you say you believe. So anyway, um, this, this ain't about me. So we're anyway, we're looking forward to going down. Haven't been down in seven years. I always remember, I just had to figure out how old Brother Graham is and then, uh, and then subtract 73 from it because we were down there on his 73rd birthday. 
in a hailstorm. It had a pretty good hailstorm down there. They're up on the side of a mountain. They're like 8,000 feet. So uh, it's, it's not big hail. It's little hail, but there's a lot of it. And so it can actually look like it snows pretty quick there in the cornfields. So keep us in prayer as we go. And, uh, and we're, we're looking forward to it. Like I said, hadn't been down there. And then the Coates family will be here uh, later in the summer. And they'll be coming in for six or eight weeks for Brother Graham's birthday. And so that'll be good. But um, I don't know. We don't, we don't have a whole lot of other announcements, right? I think that's about it. I do have a couple of visitors with us. And uh, these guys are from Cebu in uh, the Philippines. And Mrs. Spar is here. She's in the, uh, but she's in the in the nursery, so she'll meet you probably right after church, and you can visit. Brother Spar is here. Brother Spar, raise your hand. That's that's her husband back there. All right. And so, Brother Ariola and uh, bro, don't say it, Brother Labora. Yes, sir. Okay. I don't have my card, but I wrote it down. And uh, so, that's, I'm a visual guy. I have to go back and see it on the paper in my mind's eye. And uh, so, anyway, but. Um, we are looking forward to a good week. We have a lot going on. In two weeks, uh, we'll have our themed lunch. It, it is for the uh, on the July the second. It's going to be just family barbecue. So whatever whatever you got going on, okay. So, all right. Well, we're going to get right back into singing so we can get going, and uh, we're looking forward to a good night tonight. All right, let's turn to 327 springs of living water. 327. I thirsted in the barren land of sin and shame, and nothing satisfying there I found. But to blessed cross of Christ one day I came, where springs of living water did abound. Drinking at the springs of living water, happy now am I, my soul they satisfy. Drinking at the springs of living water, oh wonderful and bountiful supply. How sweet the living water from the hills of God. It makes me glad and happy all the way. Now glory, grace, and blessing mark the path I've trod. I'm shouting hallelujah all the day. Drinking at the springs of living water. Happy now am I, my soul they satisfy. Drinking at the springs of living water, oh, wonderful and bountiful supply. Oh, sinner, won't you come today to Calvary? A fountain there is flowing deep and wide. The Savior now invites you to the water free, where thirsting for it can be satisfied. Drinking at the springs of living water, happy now am I, my soul they satisfy. Drinking at the springs of living water, oh wonderful and bountiful supply. Amen. Amen. Let's turn to number 42 as we stand saved by the blood. Number 42. Saved by the blood of the crucified one, now ransomed from sin and a new work begun. Sing praise to the Father and praise to the Son. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Saved, saved. My sins are all pardoned, my guilt is all gone. Saved, saved, I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. 
the angels rejoicing because it is done a child of the father joined heir with the son saved by the blood of the crucified one saved saved my sins are all pardoned my guilt is all gone saved saved I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one saved by the blood of the crucified one the father he spake and his will it was done great price of my pardon the grim precious son saved by the blood of the crucified one saved saved my sins are all pardoned my guilt is all gone saved saved I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one let's read those around us tonight By the blood of the crucified one, all hail to the Father, all hail to the Son, all hail to my red, red, gray, three in one, saved by the blood of the crucified one, saved, saved. one. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer, asking God to bless. Brother Kemp, would you, would you word that prayer? Father, we just thank you for this evening, Lord, for this church, for the place to be here, Lord, for the word open to us, Lord, as we, as we seek the back portion of that which you blessed us, blessed us with, Father, we pray that you would bless us that again, Lord, as we uh, look forth to further your kingdom. Amen. Amen.
We did. Everybody just stayed in place. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know if there was something else going on. All right. I'll tell you what. I was talking to Brother Joseph and a little while ago, and I was watching the clock, and I was like, we have 11 minutes. And then a few minutes, I was like, we have six minutes. We have four minutes. And the people were moving, and I was like, my whole life runs literally by minutes. Yeah. And I'm like, I have, I have six minutes. He's like, how's that working out for you? I was like, horribly. <laughs> you know, usually it's like, eh, we'll go over here around five. I'm like, no, 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 no. I have to be there before five because things happen at five. At 7.48, if I notice it, when the thing goes, I have to send out notifications for prayer meetings. And, and then I immediately log on. And usually, you know, Brother Spar will meet me on there pretty fast. Brother Noah gets on pretty fast. Sister Carolyn will be there a few minutes before. And then everybody piles in the last two or three minutes. But life runs by minutes. Yeah. It is crazy how just not about. One of these days, one of these days when I grow up, I'm not going to run by minutes. I'm just going to be like, meh, we'll do it in the morning. Uh-uh. Amen. Tomorrow morning, about 8.48, Brother Noah better be getting in the vehicle. We got, we got, pl- pl- yeah, we got places to be. I'm always on time. I ain't, I ain't worried about that. It's, uh, Amen. but I've just got, I got to worry about every. It's just crazy. So one of these days, you say, what do you want to be when you grow up? Not ran by minutes. I want to turn my phone off, hand it to my wife. If somebody, somebody wants to call me, I don't even need a phone. I don't even want a phone. I don't want multiple key rings. I, I, don't, want, I don't want all that. One of these days, I want to have one key for our truck and one key for our house and be done with it. Amen? Doesn't that sound good? Yeah. I got more keys than the maintenance man. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 4. 1 Corinthians chapter number 4. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 4, thank you for standing. The Bible says, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self. Now that's somebody who's against judgment right there. He says, it don't matter to me one bit that you judge me. I don't worry about what anybody says. I don't even worry about what I think. How about that? That's that's no judgment right there. I want to preach on uh, being a good steward. Okay? And and, and usually when somebody takes this verse out of context, um, and you can certainly have the correct spiritual application, they're talking about money, but that's actually in the context, not what he's talking about at all. Okay, We'll get there. Father, we love you. Pray that you bless now the, uh, the, the reading and preaching of your word. In Jesus' name, with thanksgiving, amen and amen. And you can be seated. So stewardship is not always about finances. Right. And you, you can be a good steward with your health. Yeah. You can be a good steward with relationships. You can be a good steward with a vehicle, your home, anything. You can be a good steward. It just means taking care of it. You're a caretaker over some things. Now, certainly finances is a big deal. And if we would learn to be good stewards early on, um, you know, then then we wouldn't have the struggles that we have in life. I know a lot of people that are so desperate. Uh, They're desperate. And they'll go out and have to buy a new car because they couldn't afford... $1,500 $1,500 in repairs on a car that was perfectly fine other than those needed repairs. But because they couldn't do that, they had to, and I know that because I've done that. Didn't have money to replace the head gasket again. So you drive to the dealership with the heater turned on, top that thing off about a mile away, uh, let it sit for a minute, drive in with the heater on and at 95 degrees, 
stop the car, turn it off, move all the adjustments back over like you had the air conditioner on, and then get out and walk the parking lot for 10 minutes so you'd have a reason to be sweating as bad as you were. And then you buy the new truck. And uh, I've been there. I get it. But in, in life, there are people that are like, oh, man, my tires are wearing out and I need an oil change. Who I better trade it in? And now they saw me coming and they'll let me go out. Now they'll let you. Nobody keeps a car for seven years, it seems like. But they'll let you finance one for seven years. 84-month payments. Are you kidding? It's, it's insane. But if we were better stewards with our finances, you could. there's a lot of people that are paying for a $25,000 car, a $30,000 car, because they didn't have $3,500 that a couple of years ago, $3,500 would have bought you a decent cash car. And uh, I know because that's what I drive. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it, it, we try to be good stewards. I, I don't want to afford a car payment. So we have struggled and done without in some areas and put money back and put money back and put nickels and quarters back and all that stuff. And listen, I, I'm talking about there were days when we weren't very good stewards with money. I have paid bills out of a change jar. You get a jar full of change. I found $600 in a five-gallon bucket of my change. That's the, no wonder I didn't have no money. I was throwing it all in that stupid bucket. But if we would learn to be good stewards with our money, we wouldn't have the kind of problems that we do. I generally tell people you can make better decisions if you have $5,000 in the bank. If you have $5,000 in the bank, you look a lot less dumb when you're making financial decisions. Because when you have five grand, you want to keep five grand. Yeah. But if you have five grand, you don't have to go in debt. You don't have to mortgage your life. Does that make sense? But I'm not talking about finances tonight. I'm just trying to help you out there real quick. Paul wanted the, the church here at Corinth, this, and this is a messed up church, they got a lot of problems. He wants the church family to realize that they, the church family, the body of believers there, not just the preachers, are supposed to be ministers or servants of Christ. And he also wants them to realize that they are supposed to be stewards of what the Bible calls the, the mysteries of God. What mysteries? Well, there's a lot of mysteries in the Bible. But the biggest one is the fact that not only the Jewish people could go to heaven. Not only Jews were going to go to heaven. That Gentiles were going to be able to become the family of God. Amen. They had never been seen as equal ever since they began. They would never been equal. Let's build a tabernacle. Uh, you mixed multitudes, stay outside. Let's, uh, let's, you Jewish folk can come into this part. Only priests can go into the next part. And only the high priest, one time a year, can go into the most holy place. If you ain't a Jew, get out. Take a number, stay outside. Let's build a temple. Same thing. Jews could go in, priests had their special place, high priest, special place. The, uh, everybody else, ride it outside. Mm -hmm. Then they destroy the temple, we're going to rebuild the temple. Jews are in it to win it. All of a sudden the Samaritans said, we want to help. <laughs> Y'all a bunch of half-breeds, you ain't helping nothing. We hate you. Well then we hate you back. And that's why Jews and Samaritans are not allowed to talk. They don't talk to each other. They don't spend time with each other. They have different cities. Uh, it's all different. Why? Just hatred. Uh, hatred. And, if you, and by knowing that history, it helps you understand the, the, the Gospels. Yeah. And, and why it was so weird for Jesus to be talking to a Samaritan woman. And what in the world she was talking about uh, when she was like, you're not even supposed to be here. Why, why it surprised the disciples that he was talking to her. Uh, then you understand when Jesus is sending out the 70 that he says, don't go in, in, in any of the city of, of the Gentiles or the Samaritans. Why? Not equal. But did you know, because before Jesus said things like, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the tribes of Israel. 
It didn't say Jesus came unto the whole wide world and they received him not. It says, no, he came unto his own. And his own received him not. His earthly ministry is a Jewish ministry. At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light. That's where the burden of my soul was washed away. At the cross, Jesus Christ becomes the arbiter of the New Testament in his blood. And that's where the New Testament officially starts. Not not at Matthew 1. Matthew 1 doesn't even welcome Gentiles. Now one of them gets in on verse 5. But she was a one-off. Oh, Rahab. Got to watch them Jericho girls. She's in in verse 5. Verse 1 just starts off, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, he'd be a Jew, the son of Abraham. He, he's pre-Jew. He's the patriarch of the Jews. Abraham had an Abrahamic covenant with God concerning the Jews. David has a Davidic covenant about the throne of the Jews. You go, well, that don't, he came for everybody. No, he died for everybody. He came for the Jews. He died for everybody. Notice before, again, Jesus said, you can get mad at me all you want to. I don't care. I don't care about your dirty looks. I've been married 29 years. I'm used to dirty looks. I'm not, that make me nervous at all. I'm getting one right now. And uh, <laughs> I'm just, I am not. But listen, Jesus said, I am not sent. So either he wasn't sent to anybody else or he's a liar. Now, if you want to put Jesus on being a liar, that's up to you. I'm just going to believe him. He said, I'm not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the tribes of Israel. That tells you everything you need to know. But at the cross, all of a sudden the apostle Paul clarifies and says, there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. And all of a sudden you realize everybody's on equal footing at the cross. Yeah. Everybody's lost. You get beyond all of a sudden now Jesus rise, raises up from the dead after the cross and he goes, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Amen. Go into all the world. Yeah. Every creature. Every nation. Amen. See, everything changes at the cross. We need to understand that that's the great mystery. He's talking about that in Romans 11, Ephesians 1, Ephesians 3. Help yourself. Help yourself. Go over there and read about those mysteries and how everything changed. So, Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. He fulfilled it all. He didn't take it and go, oh, I'm going to wad it up and throw it away. No. He satisfied it. He became the propitiation for our sins. He fulfilled the law. He completed it. He put a what do you call it? exclamation mark at the end of it? Done. All of a sudden, see, you know what the problem is? When people don't know their Bible, they, when Jesus says it is finished, they don't know what that means. Yeah. Right. When Jesus said it is finished, he means all the religiousness that they had been part of up to that point. Amen. It is finished. We fit to have a new thing. We're about to have some, you go over to Hebrews 11 and all of a sudden you get down there and, and you hear about, oh, oh uh, Abraham and Moses and, 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 and all these people. And you get to verse 31, Rahab again, Matthew 1, 5. But you get Hebrews, 1, uh, Hebrews 11, 31. You learn about Rahab. Rahab perished not with them that believed not. And then you get just past that and it said, and we don't have enough time to even talk. They talk about Rahab. They ain't got time to talk about David. They ain't got time to talk about King David. We're busy. And Jephthah and and Gideon and all don't have time to talk about all them. But then it goes on and says that these people, the world wasn't even worthy of them. These are people who were sawn asunder. Listen, they, they did great exploits for God. They did all these things of whom the world was not worthy. And then we, having something so much better than they did... They didn't receive the promise. What was the promise? It was Christ. Mm -hmm. Great mystery. There's your great mystery. What's the great mystery? Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. All of a sudden, he fulfilled the law. Great mystery. As a church, 
As leaders in that church, it's our job to care for those things. Do you know most churches, I don't know if they don't have the knowledge or they don't have the guts, but they would not dare say what I just said. You can like it, lump it, bump it, or jump it, but I'm going to stick with the Bible. I invite you to come along. We're just going to stick with the scriptures. It's our job to be stewards, to care for those things. Just pretend like it matters. Just pretend like the word of God actually matters. And that we're not here for a social club. Just teach those things. To show good stewardship. You can't hide truth under the mattress. We're not going to lock it away in some safe somewhere. It's our job to take the truth. We don't have to finesse it. You don't have to caress it. Just read it and believe it. Be a Bible believer and deliver it to the next generation before you go. Amen. That's right. Amen. Paul told Timothy, same Paul. What was just talking in 1 Corinthians 4 and all the other Corinthians. 2 Timothy 2 2, he says, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same, the same, that's being a good steward, keeping it the same. Don't mess up God's word, that's good stewardship. Amen. He said, The same commit thou to faithful men. He didn't say, Just toss it off to them as you go. No, commit it to them. Commit it to their memory. Commit it to their heart. Commit it to their doctrine. Commit it to their church. Commit it to their families. Commit it into their responsibility. Give it to them. Commit it to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. They got to be faithful men because they need to be good stewards. And they need to be able to teach others also. Who's others? Next generation. Right. They, now they've got to be good church. They've got to commit it to the next group and to the next group and so on and so forth. So how are we, as stewards of these mysteries of God, found faithful? That's what it says in verse 2, didn't it? Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And that ain't just when you're trying to trick somebody into tithing. How are we going to be faithful with these mysteries that we just heard about in verse 1? Number one, learn what you're supposed to learn. That is the Bible and Bible doctrine. You've got to know the Bible. Amen. You cannot, it's just like money. You give a child $10 and they're going to try to spend 14 of it. Well. By the way, I know a bunch of grown-ups the same way. Except so you give them 1000 they're going to try to spend 1400 of it. It's just bigger amounts as they get older. You say, it don't make no sense. I know. But it don't make sense what's happening with Bible doctrine either. Yeah. Learn what you're supposed to learn. you got to know the Bible. Everything gets stunted. Everything gets frustrated. Until we commit to studying the Bible. And I'm not putting down your reading program, but your reading program ain't study. When you get over there and you're like, I'm reading three chapters today. I'm reading 30 minutes today. I'm reading whatever this reading program says. I'm going to read so many verses in the Old Testament. It's going to read a psalm, one proverb of the day, except for until we get to the uh, end of the month. And, you know, unless it's a short month and we're going to read the last three over and over again. And then something out of the New Testament. I'm, I'm not mad at your reading program, but understand that that's not study. Studying is when all of a sudden you're reading through the scriptures and you get over like 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and it talks about Jesus Christ, our Passover, and you go, I don't care what verse 8 says right this second. I'm going to study why Jesus Christ is our Passover. I'll see you in Exodus 12. And you got to run back to Exodus 12 and figure out what the deal was, why there was a Passover. And, and all of a sudden you realize, oh, oh, that was Jesus. It's talking about, it's a picture of Jesus. Yeah, Jesus shows up all over the Old Testament. That's what study will help you do. You learn about them, what they call theophanies. Yeah. You realize Genesis 1-1 was Jesus. You realize uh, uh, J- Jacob 
wrestling with Jesus. There's a little controversy, not in my mind, but there's, there's some folks that, that question back and forth on uh, Melchizedek. I believe that's Jesus. And, uh, and, and, and then all of a sudden you look at, you know, there's different places where you just see the Lord there. And you realize that even when Moses, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, yeah. so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. Pictures, pictures. Yeah. The, the, the Exodus. Egypt is a picture of sin. He led them out of sin. Took them to, to the Red Sea. Parted the Red Sea. Took them across. It's a weird picture of baptism after that. But, but they ain't ever going back. They closed the Red Sea after they went across. Sin was killed in the Red Sea. Sin was killed in the Red Sea. Amen. They got out of sin. Walls of water uh, <laughs> over half a mile high on each side of them. How's that for a public testimony? Do we trust God? <laughs> What's this? We go. Amen. Yeah, they trust God. Our baptism here, by right candidate, you got to be salvation by grace through faith. Got to be saved. We Amen. believe in believer's baptism. Yeah. It's got to be in water. And it's got to be in water, not... <laughs> We were trying, when we were looking for this building, we, we went to, I don't remember what kind of church it was, Episcopalian, something, anyway. What kind was it? Episcopal. Episcopal, okay. So we got over there, and we met up with the priest, and she was really nice. That was interesting. And then we're walking, we're doing the tour, and then we come up, and I'd never, I'd never been in one before. It had the bowl of water. And we went up, and I was like, What, what's that? And, and she said, that's our baptistry. I thought my wife and Gwelda, I forget who all else was there, they were so embarrassed. I was like, the baptistry? <laughs> Where's the stairs? <laughs> How y'all get them all up in there? And she said, we sprinkle. I said, man, what a waste of time for them to get down and go down into the water. Here is much water. Here is much water. If that's all they needed. <laughs> and I, how'd you become a priest anyway? And she said, my son had a ministry on the beach. I was like, yeah, everybody's son wants to have a ministry on the beach. <laughs> and she said, I went with him one time and I had a feeling. I felt like I was supposed to be preaching. I said, you had a feeling. Had you been eating chili prior to this? And then my wife and Gwelda were really not happy. Uh, who all was with us that day? There was like a, we had like six or eight of us. Everybody was embarrassed, but it was fun. <laughs> they wanted us to pay for their building and put us out in some little kitchen somewhere. But anyway, but here's, the th here's what I'm saying, guys. You can't skip steps. You can't skip steps. I mean, if you're going to bake a cake... You don't throw some flour and some baking soda in there and stick a toothpick in and see if it's done. You ain't done with all the ingredients. You ain't got that egg in there. You ain't got the milk in there. You ain't stirred it up. You ain't poured it in a pan. You can't just throw flour and baking powder in there and stick your toothpick in. Yeah, it came out dry, kind of powdery, but that ain't no cake. You can't skip steps. There's no way around it. And that's what's wrong today in so many ministries is people are wanting to do something, but they're clueless as to what to do because they don't know the book. They don't know where they should be standing. They're clueless about what to do. They end up going to psychology or psychobabble or doing something and just trying to get a crowd. The Bible never says go you therefore and attract a crowd. Jesus said, I will build my church. Amen. So I, I like bottoms in seats. I, I, I like bottoms in seats. I like the people to be here. But God never told me to go out and fill every seat. And by the way, when he's going to build the church, I don't even think that's talking about numerically. I think it's talking about spiritually. I'd rather have a strong church than a big church. Amen. Let's get strong first, then we can get big. Because and we'll get there in a minute. That's point three. 
We're still on number one. <laughs> the reason people get caught up in a, in a strange cult today is because they don't know God's word. The reason people burn out is because they're having to run around and figure everything out because they don't know God's word. If you know God's word and you've studied God's word, you don't have to waste a lot of time trying to figure everything out. You just do what you're supposed to do. Amen. Number two, after you learn what you're supposed to learn, grow in the Lord. Yeah. I'm talking about spiritual maturity. Amen. Spiritual maturity, you've got to have it. While learning, you're always going to have some ups and downs. There's going to be some frustrations along the way. There's going to be some confusion along the way. That's fine. Listen, we can work through that. That's no problem. That's normal. You're learning some new stuff. But you can't, again, you can't skip. Kids think they're so smart, especially homeschoolers, when, when all of a sudden they're like, oh, oh, I, I found an answer key. I'll just put all the answers in, and then I can skip. Hey, genius, how are you going to skip to the next step? The next step is predicated on this step. How, how are you going to skip this part? And now you ain't ever going to learn this part. So you're going to get frustrated and try to ink it through. And now you don't know these two parts. How are you going to go to the next part? you got to get this part down real good. And then this part's easy. Because this part already made sense. And then when those two make sense, you off and running. Suddenly you like math instead of dreading it. People just skipping steps. We have to have time to grow into who we are in Christ. Amen. Does that make sense? Amen. I mean, I love all my kids the same, but I'm a lot closer to tossing my keys to Joshua than I am to Josiah. <laughs> hey, both of them are pretty mean in a, in a go-kart. Both of them are pretty tough in a go-kart. Both of them have done a little bit of driving, but there's just something about being 15. You're at that age where you're about ready for something out there, driver's ed. You don't just toss keys. Uh, somebody was talking about changing the voting age from 18 to 16. I'm wanting them to change it to 25. Yeah. Uh, hey, there's just something about growing up that gives you a little bit of sense. And um, you got to have time to grow. Talking about who, who ought to become a pastor, 1 Timothy 3, 6, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. And then even talking about any kind of ministry, any kind of ministry whatsoever. In 1 Timothy 5, 22, it says, lay hands sud suddenly on no man, neither be partaker on another man's sin. Keep thyself pure. Don't be in a hurry. I was talking to a preacher friend the other day, and he was upset because uh, some friends visited from another church, and he's like, he's like, what are y'all, what are y'all going to do? And they're like, we're, we're eager, we're ready, man, we're, we want to be in the ministry. He's like, really? Because I need some people that are eager and want to be in the ministry. This sounds like a match made in heaven. So they went back and talked to their pastor. Their pastor said, honestly, you're not ready yet. It hurt their feelings and really upset the pastor in need. Trust that pastor. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Hey, we, my goal is that everybody in this room right now would be hardcore involved in some kind of ministry. Amen. You say, well, then why hadn't you called on me yet? Maybe you're not ready. Yeah. Yeah. We all got to hear from God about the same time on this thing. Some people want to have some lofty position before they're ready. And you got to be careful because older preachers will get desperate. And they'll hand it off to anybody, whether they're ready or not. And, and here's the deal. Not only are you going to hurt that church because you hand them a novice, you hand them some. And being a novice, I mean, you, everybody got to start somewhere. And so, but instead of handing it to some young man who may think he's ready... But maybe the pastor knows his wife ain't ready. There's some young men that are ready to charge hell with a squirt gun. And their wives are just trying to get settled on this thing. Right. Now, be careful because you could destroy a young man's ministry. You could destroy their marriage. 
And you could certainly hurt that church. Certainly hurt that church. Guys, we got to use wisdom on that. Got to use wisdom. Hey, it takes time to grow. Some people, again, they want that position, but they're just too young in the Lord. Understand this. The fruit of the Spirit, I believe, is progressive and not a cluster that's all at once. It didn't say the fruits of the Spirit. The Bible says in Galatians 5, 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Just because you get saved doesn't mean all of a sudden you have no more lust in you. It doesn't mean you don't have any more uh, uh, wrong affections. That takes a minute. That takes a little percolating. That, that takes a little, little festering before that catches on fire real good. We want to be careful about that. So listen, learn what you're supposed to learn. Read that Bible. That's how we're going to be the good steward that God expects us to be. Amen. Number two, we want to make sure that we take time to grow in the Lord and just let those things down. Hey, you start off with love. I love the Lord. Now I'm going to learn to have joy. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Okay. And then from joy, you get peace and long suffering and gentleness and you grow in the Lord. Some people are they're like, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. And they're so unsettled. They're angry. They have anger in their heart where they should not have anger. In their heart. But somebody's stupid. The world's full of stupid people. You still can't be angry all the time. That's not going to help the work of the Lord for you to be angry. Number three, teach who we're supposed to teach. You say, who am I supposed to teach? Well, find some lost people and teach them the gospel. Teach them how to be saved. That's always a great place to start. Amen. But then, hello, after, after we win them, don't just win them, wet them, and forget them. We want to have some discipleship. Amen. Make sure that they're reading and studying and that they're growing in the Lord. Yeah. Just help them along. Amen. Make sure you're teaching those at your house the Bible. It doesn't... Listen, there were some old preachers that got some bad, they gave some real bad advice. They're like, you'd hear some younger preacher go, man, my wife is really struggling because all we do is we're at church seven days a week and we're doing this and that. And all of a sudden those preachers go, listen, son, you take care of the Lord's work and the Lord will take care of your family. Right. Most of those guys lost their children. Their children are not in church and all that. Be careful. Yeah. Some old men who meant well, they gave bad advice. Yeah. It doesn't do any good for you to try to reach the whole wide world and keep them out of hell and your kids are going to hell. Yeah. Now, listen, I'm for door knocking. I'm for children's ministries. But my first children's ministry are my kids. Yeah. I want my kids to be saved. I want my kids to be right with God. I want my kids to be studying. I want my kids to know the Bible. I want my kids to grow in the Lord. I want my kids to learn to be servants. I want my kids. Now, if your kids want to come along, I'm for it. I'm certainly for your kids. All of those things. But your first burden not to be for your kids. And then just be excited to mine come along. But together, always in your own house. You want That's first. Don't put the rest of the world before your own house. In fact, it's out of order for our house to be out of order. There's a bunch of preachers today, the only doctrine they care about for qualifications is can't be married twice, can't be married, twice married, twice married. Meanwhile, their kids look like they need an exorcism. Their wives are a bunch of gossips and just a bunch of nonsense and, uh, and, and, and they're, they're, everything's falling apart and those preachers should never think about stepping down. Why? Because they've only been married once. Woo-hoo! That's one out of a whole laundry list. Right. One out of a whole laundry list. And by the way, it's probably the most arguable one yeah. of all of them. Yeah. But your house being out of order, nothing to argue about that. Right. Now your adult children 
It's hard to control what they do. But if you can't deal with your own house, how are you going to deal with the problems at the house of God? Amen. Right. We want to teach our folks at home. And then teach those that God places you in authority over. If you get a Sunday school class, it's your responsibility. You better give it to them. Mm-hmm. You can't sit around and putt-putt on this thing the whole time. I'm not against having some fun stuff in children's church. I'm, I'm for fun stuff. But get down to the business of teaching the Word of God. In a kid's Sunday school class, I'm for prizes, I'm for games. Get down to the business quickly of teaching the Word of God. In the youth group, hey man, I got it. You're, gonna have, you're probably going to have to do some fun stuff. I'm down. I'm for camps, I'm for everything. But everything we do comes back down to the teaching of the Word of God. Amen, Mom. It all comes down to enough teaching that we're, we're going to get some decisions made. Mm-hmm. It's got to be done. It's got to be done. Maybe it's a class, a ministry, a unique opportunity, discipling somebody that you led to the Lord. Hey, if you're at the nursing home, don't go over there and preach the, the same message every time, hoping they've got Alzheimer's and aren't going to yeah. notice. Uh-huh. Come Give them something fresh. Give them something helpful. We, we were at the nursing home one time I was preaching we got all done slammed my Bible hugged a few necks <clears throat> we was walking out and I think it was the other preacher that was with me he said did you just preach against fornication at the nursing home I said there's a lot more than bingo up in here a lot more than bingo and 21 happening up in here so we, yeah man I mean hey those older folks Older Christian folks, they're not going to glorify God getting caught up in sin. That ain't, that ain't no Sodom and Gomorrah's up in there. No, we got to deal with that stuff. Hey, th- hey, when I was teaching at the nursing home, preaching at the nursing homes, I, I took that serious. That was my responsibility. That's right. We had a blind lady. She wanted a Bible. We got her a Bible. It was Bible on tape, but we got her the Bible so she could hear it. We, and they wanted to give money. We wouldn't take money for ourselves, but uh, we would take money and we bought Bibles with it. We were shipping Bibles. Man, I was so excited. Somebody wrote it back and said, thank you for the Bible and uh, that they got. And I was able to read that to them folks. Man, they loved that stuff. They Amen. loved it. Hey, it doesn't matter who it, you've got a, a responsibility for. Your responsibility is not to entertain your, your, your responsibility is not to pat them on the head and tell them everything's all right if it ain't all right. Amen. Sometimes you got to drop the hammer and just preach God's word and teach them the truth of God's word. Amen. And I'll say this on teaching who you need to teach. Beware of social media. It can certainly be used. Certainly it can. But be mindful that there's nothing better, ultimately, than congregating. I mean, we run the camera. We're on social media. I'm on Facebook right now. I'm on YouTube right now. But know this. There is nothing better than us meeting together like this. Amen. There's Amen. nothing better than to give a right hand of fellowship, meet together at an altar, Pray through a problem, open up that Bible, rear back and preach, amen through that whole thing, and then get done, shake hands again, and head to the house. Hey, man, that's good. Hey, some things you can't get on the TV or the computer screen or your phone. Now, if you can't get here, I'm for online, but be mindful. Online has its drawbacks. Nothing is better than getting together and meeting with your local church family. All our teachers... And all our teachings, whether it's online or what, should be trying to funnel people through the local church. Help people get saved everywhere. I'm for worldwide evangelism. Knock them doors. Let's, hey, we preach the gospel in the middle of the ocean if we're on a cruise. We pass out tracts everywhere we go. Uh, I, we're going to Scotland in, in, in October. I've got a brick right now that needs to be folded on my desk that say, how do I get to heaven from Scotland? Amen. It, it's the same way as you get there from Grand Prairie, but I just yeah. think it, it's more likely to get read 
especially in a tourist area, if it says from Scotland. They'll be like, what? And so I get the gospel out everywhere. But if somebody asks me what they need to do next, you need to read your Bible. What do I do next? You need to get in a church. None. Guys, that is what it means to be a good steward. You can't just go, oh, we have the mysteries of God. We know more than you. We're not whatever your group is. That doesn't help. We take it, we study it, we know it, we commit it, we commit it, and then we commit to teaching it. Amen. We give it to the next generation. We, we, we give it amongst ourselves. We get settled. We get settled on that doctrine. You get settled on truth. Amen. Hey, instead of becoming a man follower, instead of becoming a man believer, yeah. instead of just becoming some book believer, we become Bible believers. Amen. Where you can come when somebody says, well, what about this? And what about that? It doesn't matter. It just says right here. Right here. Thus saith the Lord. Amen. Thus saith the Lord. Well, I just studied the New Testament. You're going to miss all these pictures of Christ? Yay. You're going to miss all the fulfillment of the prophecies? Amen. No, it's all like one giant puzzle. Yeah. My wife has some big puzzle going right now on the table behind the couch. All of a sudden, she's like flipping lights on. I was like, what's going on? She sits there and she's getting that puzzle. You know what she does? She recognizes this little bouquet of flowers over here. She recognizes this doorway over here. Maybe, maybe there's a car or some water over here. Some blue sky with a little piece of cloud in it over here. And the more you, you look at those pieces and you study them, Going, oh, I know where that fits over here. Oh, that fits over here. Amen. And you start figuring out those little pieces, and those little big pieces become a big deal. And all of a sudden, those big pieces all start to fit together, and you begin to see the whole puzzle. Mm -hmm. You start off with the straight edges, and you get that outside framework. And once you get that framework, it's exactly the same way in the Bible. Amen. Amen. Old Testament, New Testament. Law versus grace. Yeah. Ten Commandments, Jesus. Amen. Heaven, hell. Creation, destroy the world, start over. Amen. Tribes, church, rapture, tribes. Amen. All of a sudden, the little pieces... Become bigger pieces. And all of a sudden you figure out where them bigger pieces is. And pretty soon you keep adding all the pieces until you have the complete picture. Yeah. Why is it sitting on a different table at our house than the dinner table? Because it's going to be hard to get the whole picture if there's spaghetti sauce on it. <laughs> so what do you do? You become a good steward. And you put it on its own table. And it gets its own time. And it gets its own place. We don't fold laundry on it. You don't eat cheeseburger on it. You don't, you don't, you don't cover up with it at night to keep you warm. It, it is what it is. And you're trying to get the whole picture. Hey, guys, be careful how you handle this book. Yeah. Amen. And this is where we get the whole picture. Okay. Want to be a good steward? I'm for you handling your finances right. But how you handle the word of God is what you're going to be judged on for all eternity. Yeah. Father, we love you. We thank you for being good. Lord, I pray that you would always help us not to have a haughty spirit, not to be prideful, but to be earnest in our study, to be faithful in, in our work. And Father, help us to uh, just be our utmost best for you. We want to be good stewards of the teachings of the Bible. We have to have them. We have to learn them. We have to know them, be committed to them so we can commit them to others who will be able to teach others also. We are simply one leg of a very long marathon. Father, help us to run our race with the patience and the diligence that we need with our eyes on Jesus. We love you, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Let's all stand together. If God spoke to your heart, the altars are open, the prayer benches. People are praying right where they're at.
Amen, amen. We're going to do something a little bit different. We do have a couple of guests with us. Uh, they got here today about 4.30, 4.45. Uh, they didn't have gas to go anywhere else. And so um, they're preachers. They're from the Philippines. They spent all their money to get here, and they're trying to get meetings. Uh, I was about to be out of town. I, I couldn't give them a meeting here tonight. But we can help them with some gas money if, if, if God lays it on your heart. Let me get our junior ushers to come up. And, uh, and so God just led me, you know, just laid it on my heart. So um, I know you, you've got buckets. Get a bucket right here. And, uh, and so, hold on, that one's already got something in it. That's different. Do what? There's an envelope. Pass that over so I can get where it goes. And um, all right, boys, somebody puts an envelope in, make sure it gets where it goes. And uh, so anyway, if you want to give some cash tonight, It'll help them get down the road. They are staying in Crandall, and so they've got a little bit of a drive to go. And, uh, and then once they get to Crandall, they've got to go somewhere else. So it'd be nice if we gave them enough where they can get to Crandall and then get where they're going next. And, and they're traveling around uh, for a very short time, just two months, and, um, and they're, gonna, uh, they're just trying to get some support going. Brother Ariola is just trying to raise uh, support for him and a church and uh, try to get that going. So, um, and again, we can't, can't be a part of that this time, but um, they may get to come back a different time. And um, after we have a chance to meet sending churches and all that kind of stuff, figure out doctrine and all that kind of stuff. But, um, but we can help them with some gas money, get them down the road, okay? If not, they'll just be here next time you show up. <laughs> they'll, be, they'll be sitting in the hallway by the Coke machine. You're going to have to deal with that. And so, so... Anyway, but if we can uh, show a little bit of love tonight, that'll help them get down the road, maybe, maybe buy a cheeseburger or something on the way home and, uh, and all that because they're, they're in their car. And so um, just they're in a rental car. So, but, um, so hopefully it gets good gas mileage, but we can still give, try to help them get down the road, okay? I kept talking long enough for everybody to get to their wallet. Y'all good? Yeah, Women, did you, did you find your pocketbook? That's what they say in North Carolina, isn't it? Your po pocketbook? I don't know. Anyway, all right, let's go to Lord in prayer. You are dismissed after the offering plates pass by you. After they pass by, you're dismissed. Father, we love you. We thank you for the day. I pray that you would bless this offering, that it might go to these preachers, and uh, that it might help them uh, get down the road a little ways. We love you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.